Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. Even better, spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. All right. Welcome to the Great California Cab Shootout Freestyle Friday edition. This is part two or probably part three of a three or probably four part series that will talk about how wines are priced. Today's show will give you the background on this collection of six Cabernet Sauvignons from the 2016 vintage in California. Everything from an entry level or value wine from California to an icon wine from the Diamond Creek AVA in Napa Valley. Now, I have recorded the first part just now and it's probably close to after editing 50 minutes to an hour. So I probably broke it up into two episodes. So bear with me on this. This one, I don't know how long it's going to take. The teleprompter tells me 29 minutes. I'm going to try to keep it around that. So hopefully this will be one whole episode by itself. Anyway, this is part of my How the Sausage is Made series of Freestyle Friday episodes. So we learned why wines cost what they cost in the previous episode or two of this series. If you haven't watched it, I highly suggest you do since I'll be referring to it often instead of re-explaining everything concerning farming and winemaking practices. I get it. If you haven't watched them and you're getting this one, the too long didn't watch version is expensive grapes, expensive equipment, expensive people equals expensive wine. Oh, if you don't make a lot of it too. Okay. All right. Let's meet the lineup once again and talk about each winery. I'll give some commentary on the price of the wine using what we learned last time. Our leadoff wine is the 2016 Murphy Good Cabernet Sauvignon for 10 bucks. It's California Cabernet Sauvignon. ABV is 13.5%. The wine enthusiast gave it 89 points. The 2006 production was 140,000 cases per a Wine Spectator article uh, talking about the purchase of the winery by Kendall Jackson. So this is a while back when they did that. This wine is the most basic as far as appellations or location. By law, the grapes can come from anywhere in California. Most of the time, a wine like this will come from what is called the Central Valley or bulk wine growing areas. Being a state appellation, all that's required is 75% of the wine to be Cabernet Sauvignon. Wines like this are usually 75% of the stated grape variety, with the remaining 25% being something less expensive like Merlot, Syrah, Zinfandel, Petit Verdot, or Petit Syrah, or other grapes could include Charbonneau or Alicante Boucher. Being 10 bucks, this wine is most certainly adjusted to meet a certain outcome. This wine will very likely taste very similar, if not exactly the same each year. Value wines from the US almost never show significant vintage variation, precisely because the grapes are coming from areas all over the state. I covered this in the last episode, where the grapes come from. Also, this wine will have some kind of oak alternative to give it any oaky flavors or aromas. I don't know if it has it, but the text sheet did not say anything about oak, right? Because there was no oak aging in this thing. Acidity or pH will uh, will adjust will be adjusted and possibly alcohol with it being 13.5%. Don't be surprised if Mega Purple is in this wine. I really don't know if I can taste Mega Purple like other people claim they can. Well, I don't know the the RS or the residual sugar for the wine and checking out the 2017 Merlot on the LCBO website out of Canada, a eh? the wine is only four grams per liter of RS. That's perfectly reasonable. Uh, and quite frankly, a little surprising that it's only four grams per liter for the Merlot, but that can happen even at 13.5% alcohol, but this won't be something like Apothic Red, which is 15 grams per liter of RS. In other words, a wine that naturally came to 13.5% ABV in the final RS of 4 grams per liter is definitely possible. But I still maintain that all of these were probably adjusted to get the same end result each year. Call it making wine by the numbers. Nothing wrong with that. 
Remember, this is all about economies of scale, so you need to control costs at every stage of the production. It's one of those keeps the lights on kind of wines. High production of a wine that the average drinker will like. Like I mentioned, I don't have exact production numbers, but given the production in 2006 when KJ bought them and the implication the purchase would increase total production, I wouldn't be surprised if there's at least 50 to 100,000 12 pack, 12 pack cases made of this wine. That converts to 600,000 to 1.2 million bottles. Consistency is key and you want to build a brand loyalty with that and also project a lifestyle that the person who drinks this wine will identify with. It's not meant to be a serious wine you contemplate, but something that just tastes good. All right, so who's Murphy Good? Well, they were founded in Sonoma County in 1985 by Tim Murphy, Dale Good, and Dave Reddy. I'm really not sure why Dave's name is not part of the winery's name. Their concept, according to the website, was establish a serious winery built around the concept of don't take life seriously. The current winemaker is the son of Dave Reddy, and that's Dave Reddy Jr. Now, they make a wide variety of wines from the usual suspects of grapes, Cab, Chard, Zin, Pinot, Sauve Blanc, etc. Value price like this one, uh, and up to around 40 bucks. They're currently owned by Jackson Family Wine. Yes, that's the same company that makes Kendall Jackson. All right, so Jackson Family Wines is still a family-owned company. It's a very, very large family-owned company or winery, but it's still family-owned. And they have wineries, or I've partnered with wineries all over the world. They got it all. From value to icon brands, they do a lot of good things in the industry, even if Psalms and other professionals sometimes forget how iconic Jess Jackson is. All right, next up the bat is the 2016 Buena Vista Vinicultural Society Cabernet Sauvignon, $19. It's from the North Coast. It's Cabernet Sauvignon sourced from the Fountain Grove District AVA. So this was a new one for me. I didn't realize that Sonoma County or this, this AVA actually existed, which that's my bad. And it's in Sonoma County. We also have the Sonoma Mountain AVA and the Alexander Valley AVA. And then it says other North Coast areas. So those first three are all from Sonoma County. And then you have North Coast. The ABV is 13.5%. We have total city, 5.6 grams per liter. The pH is 3.96. And the RS is actually 2 grams per liter via the LCBO. I had no ratings on this wine. All right, so remember from last week how location, location, location is important? Well, we've, we've drilled down one additional level. All right, so in my world, if I was doing the exam, I would say this wine is from the United States, California, North Coast. You go largest to smallest region. 20 bucks is the boundary of premium and super premium wines. Depending on how a retailer is pricing this wine, it'll fall in either one of those two categories. I don't know any percentages, but at least 85% of the grapes must come from the North Coast AVA and at least 75% must be Cabernet Sauvignon. All right, so for those of you doing wine studies, I realize that I've misunderstood the AVA laws here in the United States. I thought that if a wine was varietally labeled with an AVA, that's not California, it's like North Coast, Napa, whatever, that the wine needed to be at least 85% of that grape variety. The TTB's regulation states that 85% of all grapes in the wine must come from that AVA. This is regardless of what grapes may be listed, like on the label, like Merlot, well, front label. At this level, wines are starting to get more serious. Vintage will start to mean something. There will be less manipulation, but they will still be doing certain things as far as winemaking techniques to keep the quality and taste consistent. This could still include everything from the Murphy Good wine, but hopefully not all. Oak alternatives are still a distinct possibility and are actually very likely. Things like Mega Purple are less likely, but I can assure you there are higher price wines, like I mentioned last time, that will use it. However, when you get to this level, you're more likely to find the Petites being used for color and flavor in addition to other Bordeaux grapes like Merlot. And so being 13.5%, there could be some alcohol adjustments since we're now at an RS of two grams per liter. It's not impossible to naturally have these numbers. But given that we're talking California and fruit gets really ripe with no problems, the original ABV could have been higher. Like value wines, wines in this ballpark still need some consistency. The average wine, make, wine drinker, I'm sorry, 
expects it to taste of higher quality, so making those adjustments to the wine is not uncommon. And so is Buena Vista. So in the OGs of California wine, the estate was founded in 1857 in the town of Sonoma. We're talking Cali wine royalty here. The, wine describe, the winery describes itself as California's first premium winery. It was founded by the self-proclaimed Count of Buena Vista, Agustin Harazni. He came from Hungary in 1842. He became a 49er and then decided to pursue wine in Sonoma after that. He is considered the father of modern California winemaking. He was definitely a pioneer, not just in wine, but in other things. He lived life to the fullest and was very instrumental in wine and a risk taker. He died while in Nicaragua looking to create a sugar plantation. I saw the winery change hands a few times after uh, Harazi's death. The vineyards were destroyed by Phylloxera. Then Prohibition kept the winery closed. It was revived post-Prohibition and changed hands a few more times and grew to 1,000 acres. Finally, in 2011, it was acquired by the Boisse Collection, which is led by JCB or Jean-Charles Boisse. He's a character. I want to meet him someday. Hey, JCB, if you're watching this, let's hook up. All right. The winery is also listed on the National Register of Historic Places, a California historical landmark and a Sonoma County historical landmark. They also make a wide range of wines. Now, I believe this is a DI wine. I also believe that the Murphy Good is one. Now, DI means direct import. It's not an imported wine, but it's typically a wine meant for specific retailers or restaurants, usually an almost exact replica of another wine with a slight change in recipe. These wines usually come with a great margin for everybody involved. Well, how can you tell? Well, not being on a winery's website is a clue, but that's not 100% reliable. Luckily, someone at the winery was able to provide me with a tech sheet to fill in some blanks. Many of their wines are $30 and above, going as high as $250. Given that the grapes are sourced from multiple areas, its production is probably in the tens of thousands of cases. I'm, I'm totally guessing here. But especially if it's a DI wine, like, a, like I suspect, you need to have enough cases to supply, say, large chains. All right, batting third is the 2016 Silver Ghost Cabernet Sauvignon for 35 bucks. Now, this is Napa Valley, blend of 90% Cabernet Sauvignon, Clone 7, Clone 337, Hey, that's the origin of my first wine channel, 1337 wine. And then uh, 5% Cabernet Franc and 5% Petit Ferdot. This was sourced from one third each of Rutherford, Calistoga, and the Yountville AVAs or sub AVAs of Napa. It was aged 22 months in 50% French New Oak. The ABV is 14.5%. It scored 93 points from the tasting panel and a gold medal from San Francisco International Wine Com Competition. 91 points from Wilfred Wong, 90 points from wine enthusiasts Decanter and James Sucklin. We are smack in the middle of ultra premium. We now start seeing oak specifically mentioned on tech sheets. So it's going to be a little more likely on tech sheets you're going to start seeing oak mentioned is what I'm trying to get at. So, but I'm also not saying that you won't have a tech sheet for wines under 30 bucks or under 20 bucks or even under 15, but most likely those lower price wines really don't have a lot to say on a tech sheet as far as like the, the tech technical numbers. And the consumer of that $15 bottle of wine from Cali usually doesn't care about the pH of the wine. We've also drilled down another level. So United States, California, North Coast, Napa Valley. As a result, more expensive grapes mean more expensive wines. Add oak barrels, so 50% new and from France. And wine sitting in inventory for a total of two years also drives up costs. Now, I'm not saying we're finally talking real wine here, but the winemaker is even less likely to do any adjustments unless necessary to keep the wine on track. No guarantees with wines in this category, but according to the documents from the trade page, the winemaker and owner, Weston Eitzen, uses minimal intervention. This usually means only minor adjustments, if any at all, to the wine. Now, what I just talked about is the category in general. I'm not saying that Weston does adjustments because I asked him, what does minimal interventions mean to you? And he kindly replied to me, which was awesome to get a reply. So this is, um, this is what he said when I asked him that question. So I'm going to quote it. I like to think of low intervention as, in a way, not making the wine, but shepherding grapefruit to its destination of great wine. 
Knowing when not to do something can be as important as when to do something. Okay, so I interpret this as he pretty much just lets the wine do what he needs, what needs to happen. If he needs to guide it in some way, then he does. And I'm not saying he's going in and manipulating things, but he might have, you know, it, it, there might be an acid adjustment. Maybe, maybe the acid is too low and he has, he has to acidify, but not to do anything other than just to make sure like the wine doesn't go below a certain pH. The lower the pH, the more chance of, I'm sorry, the higher the pH or the, or the lower the acid, the more chance of spoilage, you know, bacterial spoilage or other things happening. So, I mean, acid adjustment is not uncommon in, you know, around the world. I don't, you know, I don't think he's adding mega purple. I don't think there's a need to add mega purple to this, to a wine like this. Um, I don't think he's doing it in alcohol adjustments. If, you know, if anything, it's maybe an acid adjustment and that's probably it. Unless he has a stuck fermentation, he might have to do, you know, some stuff with that. But my guess from what he, what the, the website said and what he's, what he sent to me is he pretty much just, you know, presses the grapes, gets the fermentation started, probably does temper, temperature control to make sure everything runs smoothly and might adjust temperature here and there to keep the fermentation going at a certain rate. And that's probably it, you know, has the oak aging, you know, checks the, checks the lab numbers, make sure the acid and the, the pH and the TA are fine and, you know, everything else, you know, checks for other levels. And if he has to make an adjustment, does, but he sounds like he's pretty hands off, to be honest. Okay. All right. So the other thing is you also saw that the wine got a lot of ratings of 90 points or higher. So this can also add to the reputation of the winery and therefore the price. So uh, I didn't get production numbers from Weston. I didn't ask in the initial email and I didn't follow up with it, but he only makes one wine. So this literally can mean anything in terms of production. And I'm not going to try to guess. I'm sure he makes enough wine to earn a living. <clears throat> now the winery's first mention is 2012. When you look at the web page, it looks like it's 2016, but he confirmed it was 2012. Um, so Weston Eidson is the owner and winemaker. His great, great grandfather was a pioneer of the auto industry in England. And his name was John Montague. He was also close to the founders of Rolls Royce. Hey, the name of the wine comes from the famous and John's favorite car, the 1909 Silver Ghost. Not a bad thing to name wine after, right? Now, Weston is from the UK, but has traveled extensively around the world to learn about wine. He settled down in Napa to start making wine. He's had some incredible mentors, and I told him this in the email. Uh, so mentors in Napa, like Jason Moore of Modus Operandi Cellars, where Weston worked for a while, uh, and then Russell Bevan of Bevan Cellars. Okay, we got some rock stars there. Okay. To keep the baseball theme going, we've got the next batter up. Now, in baseball, this is the cleanup hitter, the guy who's supposed to hit that grand slam. Not saying that the next one can't fulfill this role. It can, but we have two more heavy hitters. So let's just say we've got a strong middle rotation here. Okay, next up on the plate, the 2016 Barnett Vineyard Spring Mountain Cabernet Sauvignon for 80 bucks. Spring Mountain District, Napa Valley. A blend of 76% Cabernet Sauvignon, 11% Petit Verdot, 9% Merlot, and 4% Cabernet Franc. It's sourced from their estate vineyards and also York Creek Vineyards, which they do own. It's aged for 22 months in French oak, 65% new, 35% two to five years old. ABV is 14.6%, total acidity 7.2 grams per liter, pH 3.64, which is right at the sweet spot. Its RS is 1.25 grams per liter. So thanks to Andy Barty for emailing those last values to me. Only 105 barrels are made, so it's approximately 2,600 standard size bottles. It got 92 points from Wine Spectator, 91 points from Robert Parker, AKA the Wine Advocate. Parker actually retired from reviewing wines in 2019 after he sold the Wine Advocate a few years earlier. All right, so 80 bucks. This wine is not cheap by any means. I'm not saying the Silver Ghost is cheap either, most people consider wine over $20 expensive. Now we're getting to prices where someone is well off can afford to drink something like this a few times a month, maybe even once a week or a couple times a week. And we are now in luxury territory, almost dead center of that, of that spread. It can also be a special occasion wine. Wine is a gift, a Saturday night dinner at home wine, going to a small dinner party wine, impressive date wine, 
at a restaurant, we're pushing 150 bucks. So you're making a statement. Like Silver Ghost, we have a breakdown of grapes, where they come from and the oak. We are also another level down. So United States, California, Napa Valley, Spring Mountain District, higher rent district in an already high rent district. Though we only have 76% Cabernet Sauvignon here, Still, it meets the minimum required for an AVA. Petit Verdot makes a strong appearance. It's a common blending grape with Cab that can bring structure and tannin. If you remember my, my band story from last time, this is where I kind of got some of that. All right, so all four grapes that are used in this wine are part of the big five Bordeaux grapes. Really, there are six traditionally, but so little Carmenere is planted in Bordeaux that's kind of forgotten. All these grapes play well with each other and bring something to the table. I'll get into the cost of the grapes at the end, but each of these grapes have a different cost, even when you own the vineyards. Cabernet Sauvignon is actually only the second most expensive grape in the group, as far as like when you're buying grapes. Can you guess the rest? In addition to the internal cost of the grapes, all the grapes on estate-owned vineyards is hand harvested. So both vineyards they got it from did hand harvesting. And this is an additional cost to the wine. You'll see that we still have 22 months of oak aging, but we are now at 65% new and 35% being two to five years. For the Silver Ghost, we don't know what the other 50% is in terms of how old those barrels are, but they're probably like a two or maybe in three to five year type of thing. But we have money tied up in new barrels and inventory sitting on a shelf. Here's another thing. We now have production numbers for a specific wine, 105 barrels. That's 2,625 cases, 31,500 bottles. From what I can tell, or what I can see on their website, they are doing the usual winemaking here. They mentioned punch downs to get extraction from the grapes and fermenting each block separately. Okay, so what about the winery itself? It was founded by the husband and wife team, Fiona and Hal Barnett, in 1983 after multiple visits to Napa in the 80s. They purchased 40 acres of land in the Spring Mountain District. They were not there were not any vineyards on the site, so they had to start from scratch. The first vintage was 1989 with 232 cases of this same wine. They didn't move in full time to the property until 1991. They've been added ever since. They have a total production of 8,000 cases right now from about nine different wines. So 5,000 to 6,000 of those cases come from the Spring Mountain District. All these wines get distributed to 19 states in the US, three states in Canada, and 11 other countries. So while 96,000 bottles sounds like a lot of wine, and it is, it's also gotta be spread out. Realize not every wine gets distributed to all the places, but those 31,600 bottles of cab probably are, or for the most part. This winery is solidly in the medium production category in my opinion. It might be still small to medium. Now we're in the top of Spring Mountain here, uh, 2,050 feet to be exact. So we got some great mountain fruit going on, higher altitude and above the fog line or inversion layer. So plenty of sunshine during the growing season, at least three extra hours per day as a matter of fact, at least according to the website. Okay, I know that this is a lot to take in, but we only have two more wines to dissect. Our fifth wine is a 2016 Senegal States Cabernet Sauvignon, $110, Napa Valley, Blend of 83% Cabernet Sauvignon, 6% Petit Verdot, 6% Malbec, and 5% Merlot. Fermented in 85% stainless steel and 15% oak tank. Aged for 20 months in 85% new oak. Now the oak's not specified. ABV is 14.7% alcohol, 4,000 cases produced, that's 48,000 bottles. Now realize all these production, like all these bottles, numbers are assuming they're all this size. The majority of like wines, even when we get to the higher price wines, will be a 750, but they will make some that are 1.5s, maybe some that are three liters, probably very few, and you might have some that are, uh, are half bottles, but we're just assuming 750s. This wine scored some points too, 95 points for Robert Parker, Wine Spectator, and Jeb Dunnick, 92 points from James Suckling. Let me talk about the, why I'm putting these ratings in there because I've never put ratings in any of my shows. I'm showing you the pedigree of these wines by other people. I'm not, I mean, I'm kind of reviewing these wines in the next episode, but I'm really just doing the blind to see where we are quality wise. 
okay? We are starting to get into rarefied air here. These are those skybox wines, the super luxury category of wines, 100 to 200 bucks. Now you might think we're taking a step backwards since we're only dealing with just Napa Valley fruit. The estate sits wholly inside St. Helena AVA, which is a sub AVA of Napa Valley. So why they chose to use Napa Valley AVA rather than St. Helena AVA, I really couldn't tell you. In my opinion, I just don't see St. Helena on many labels. The Rutherford AVA is seriously a stone's throw away from the property, so it may be just that Napa Valley has more recognition than St. Helena to them. Don't get me wrong, for the most part, Napa Valley is plenty for a wine from this area. It doesn't have to have the sub AVA. The amount of Cabernet Sauvignon compared to the other wines is higher, so this might be another reason why we're talking more expensive. The least expensive grape in the blend, Merlot, is also lower than the others. This will also help explain some of the cost. Add in that oak tanks are used for 15% of the fermentation. Not sure if these are new or not, but I understand these are not open top fermenters. These are regular barrels or larger punchins, typically around 500 liters versus the 225 for Brie. Your amount of new oak is also increased to 85%. The text sheet doesn't specify French or American, or any other type. If it's all French, then that's some serious cash. However, if it was, I would think that they would tell us. So it might be a mixture of French and American. Probably more French than American, but you know, I don't know. The mixing of barrels is not uncommon. Uh, it's expanding the spice rack, so to speak, and it can also be a way to save costs from year to year. All right, 4,000 cases, 48,000 bottles. They produced four other wines in 2016, which totaled only 1,540 cases. So total production is just over 66,000 bottles for the 2016 vintage. Now each year they have a different amount of wines available, so their production numbers will vary. Plus 2016 was only their fourth vintage. The point is we have <clears throat> less total production than the Barnett for the same year. So scarcity might be a factor. Ratings. Yes, they got quite a few ratings of 92 to 95 points. They quickly have built a reputation for their wines. An article I read about them from the Napa Wine Project, there's a link below in the description, talks about the 2013 vintage being reasonably priced. I don't know what that means exactly, but let's say it wasn't sold for 110 bucks. Maybe it was somewhere in that 50 to, 50 to 80 dollar range. Let's get into some history of the winery because that will also help with the pricing. This property is another one that has a long history in, of winemaking in Napa Valley. While it was founded in 2013 as Senegal, it was called the Inglewood Estate prior to that. Now, this is no relation to the Ingle Nook Estate, which is actually very close by in the Rutherford AVA. In fact, it's a short 3.6 mile drive to the south with both properties butting up against the Mayakamas Mountains to the west. As Inglewood Estate, it was founded in 1879 by Alton Williams. As what happens in the wine world, the estate changed hands multiple times over the years. In 2013, David and James Senegal purchased the property. James was a co-founder of Costco, and his son David worked for Costco for 21 years. So they have a bit of disposable income to buy a winery. It's very common in Napa. The property had been making wine, so they were able to hit the ground running with their label Senegal for the 2013 vintage instead of waiting at least three to four years. But instead of being the stereotypical wealthy people who buy a winery because it's cool, David went right to work getting his hands dirty in the vineyards. He put a lot of work and technology into the vineyards to be able to really drill down and get all kinds of data like temperature, soil, moisture, and barometric pressure, pressures. They also have a very sophisticated irrigation system that can pinpoint individual vines. In addition to this, significant work was done in the winery ex with expanding the existing caves into the Mayakamas Mountains. So a lot of money was invested in this winery. Let's remember, at the end of the day, a winery is a business. So when you invest in a business, you expect that investment to get paid back in a reasonable amount of time. In addition to all this, they have a world-class winemaker, Ryan, Ryan Noth. He's worked with a who's who of winemakers from Napa and elsewhere, people like David Abreu, Michel Roland, Frederick Johansson from Staglin family, and Jim Barber and Philippe Melka at uh, Gandona Winery. These are all legends, and I guarantee you Ryan didn't come cheap. Their director of operations, Trevor Antoyini, I think I got that right, also has a great background. 
working with Peter Michael in Sloan Estate. So expensive property, grapes, equipment, and personal equals expensive product. Now, I mentioned this in the last episode or two episodes ago about, you know, initial costs. You may have a boatload of cash. So you may not be really worried about your making back your initial investment, but you want to stay profitable. I don't know if that's the case here or, you know, they're fi fi figuring in the cost of buying the winery, the cost of all, all the upgrades, the stuff they're doing in the vineyard, making the caves. I have no idea. I do know that there are wineries in Napa where they're like, yeah, we don't worry. We're not going to worry about making our money back from the initial investment. However, from that point on, we need to have a profitable company. So I don't know what the deal is with this. I'm not going to worry about it because I don't really care. But if I was going to open a winery, that's what I would do because I would have won the lottery. I'm not opening a winery. All right. And now we get to our last wine. It's cleanup hitter. All right. For the group. Yeah. I know the cleanup hitter is fourth. We already talked about that. But we're in the last one here. So the 2016 Diamond Creek Vineyards Gravelly Meadow. 250 bucks for the 750. This one cost me 130. That's actually kind of a deal because half bottles are usually at least two thirds, if not even more of the cost of a full bottle. So the fact that I got this for almost half price, that's pretty killer. All right, Diamond Mountain District, Napa Valley, Gravelly Meadow Vineyard. Now this is a blend of 88% Cabernet Sauvignon, 8% Merlot, 2% Cabernet Franc, and 2% Petit Verdot. The vineyard size of that vineyard is only five acres. Elevation is 550 feet. The soils of the vineyard are rocky, stony, and porous. The aspect is relatively flat. So we're not talking, there's no like aspect to it, like a angle. And it's not like south facing, north facing. It's just kind of relatively flat. Hand harvested. ABV is 14.5%. Here come the scores. 100 points, Robert Parker. 96 points, James Suckling. 95 points, Wine Spectator. Decanter and Connoisseur's Guide. 94 points, Wilfred Wong and Wine Enthusiast. 92 points of Wine and Spirits. The total production of all wines. Okay, so I've seen numbers between 1,500 to just shy 3,200 cases for all the wines they make. In part one, I talked about a five-acre vineyard. I think it was a higher-acre vineyard now that I remember. Uh, and the expected production would be 1,250 cases. I upped that for that example wine, but I forgot I didn't edit the video. Um, but anyway, so I did use four tons per acre in that, in that, um, example. So let's assume it's five acres. They would at four tons per acre, this would be about 1250 cases. It might be less. They might be getting less tons because you, especially when you're getting higher, higher quality wines or higher price wines, you can start seeing three and two tons per acre as the, as common when you're getting super high quality or high price wines. Um, Anyway, so who knows what the exact number is, okay? All right, so icon pricing for a truly iconic winery. These are the guys that started single vineyard wines in Napa Valley. They were the first to break the triple digit barrier in Napa Valley as far as like $100 bottle. But we're getting a bit ahead of things, All right? So 250 bucks, not chump change. Yeah, I bought the half bottle, saved money. And uh, how much did I spend on all these wines? $384. Not the baller New Year's Eve amount I did, but still, it's kind of expensive. This is very likely the second most amount of money I've spent on wine for a single episode. Now, if I consider Senegal to be in that rarefied air of super luxury, the skybox in the stadium, Diamond Creek is like being the owner of the team. Are there Napa wines out there that are more expensive? Absolutely. But here's my theory. When we are getting above $100, especially when we're getting above $200, the quality of the wines will be very, very similar. It's all the other things that raise the prices, especially the value of the brand. Let's think luxury cars. 50, 60, $80,000 cars, right? $100,000 cars. I'm not talking supercars like, like you know, Lamborghini Countach and all that stuff. I'm talking like, you know, Mercedes, BMW, Cadillac, Lexus, you know, that type of stuff. The quality of those cars are equivalent. It's the styling. It's like the little touches in the interior. Maybe they have a, maybe one has a THX sound system. The other one has some other super duper sound system. Maybe 
the the wood's a little different. Maybe just the feel of the car is a little different. Maybe the ride's slightly smoother, but they're all going to be about the same. It's all about maybe the quality of those finishing materials that makes that an $80,000 car versus a $50,000 car. It might be that the reputation of that car or that model car is a higher reputation, even though the cost of materials is still the same as the $50,000 car. Personal preference, what's more popular, all that kind of stuff. In wine, when we're getting really expensive, 100, 200 for sure and higher, the quality is, I'm not saying exactly the same, but the quality to price ratio, as far as like how much, like this is $250 bottle of wine, right? If I tasted a $500 bottle of wine, is it going to be twice as good as this? I think not. Is this wine 25 times better than this one? Maybe not 25 times better, but it's definitely going to be a better wine. Or I hope so when I taste all these. These should not flip. My, I'm going to say this in the next episode. These, these might flip, probably not. These might flip, these might flip, or these might flip, okay? I'm not gonna, we're not gonna see like a dramatic flip of like here, 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 that type of thing. That will be like these flip or these flip, but they could happen as far as what I perceive. Anyway, let's break down the wine uh, first. So United States, California, North Coast, Napa Valley, Diamond Mountain District, Gravelly Meadow Vineyard. Yes, we zeroed in on that. And that's only five acres in size. Bullseye, brah. And the price tag to go with it. We've got 88% cab. We are now at the highest amount of cab listed. And while we have 8% Merlot, I guarantee you this is not inexpensive Merlot. Not that the others were, but this, is Merlo, but this Merlot is probably the equivalent of some of the most expensive Merlot in Napa. Again, hand harvested. As far as anything else, I just don't know. They don't have any information on the website. I did request information from them, but... As of me recording this, they never replied. If you notice, yeah, this was rated 100 points by Robert Parker. Okay, not the Robert Parker, but whomever handles Napa wines at the Wine Advocate. But we also have 96 and 395 pointers and so on. All right, Mark, I thought you didn't care about ratings. I don't. If a wine's getting 96 points or better, I will pay attention to it. And 100 points, yeah, someone's considered a perfection. Whether it is or not, doesn't matter. But I can tell you that wines like this should always are getting 90 points or better. And this is what happens with wines from Diamond Creek. They consistently score high and they do have an iconic reputation, not because of high scores, but because they make kick-ass wines. Add in the scores and you kind of get that self-perpetuating thing going on. Did I mention this wine only comes from five acres? Yeah, I know I already did. It's the smallest of the three main vineyards. So not a lot of this wine is made. The total production is fairly small as I already mentioned. Let's talk about the vineyards real quick. Of course, we have five acres of gravelly meadow. This is the coolest of the vineyards and is a sandy type soil with rocks and stones. And it's mostly flat. Red Rock Terrace is seven acres. It is warmer than gravelly meadow. The soil here is iron rich and rocky, hence the name. It's got a bit of a steeper slope to it. Volcanic Hill is eight acres and is, well, a more volcanic ashy type of soil. It's the warmest of the three vineyards. Well, that doesn't have the 20 acres, Mark. You're right. There are two other vineyards, Lake Vineyard next to the lake and that Al dug out himself, which has planted the three quarters of an acre and one acre of a one acre vineyard planted to Petit Verdot. All right, so Lake Vineyard will only have its own wine in exceptional years. This is actually the coldest of all the vineyards. It's only been made maybe a dozen times in the whole 50 years of the history of the winery. Here's the deal. I'm not sure if the grapes from these last two vineyards get incorporated to, into the other wines or they don't get used at all. I have conflicting information about that. All right, so what's the deal with, the, with this winery? All right, well, it was founded by 1968 by Al and Boots uh, Brownstein on Diamond Mountain. The property was purchased in 1967, however. This is before there were AVAs in the U.S., Al and Boots didn't come up in the wine industry. They both did other things. Al owned a drug company called Standard Brand Company. I did see what Boots did back then, but she was divorced with two sons when she met Al on a blind date. All right. In the 1960s, Al took a French wine appreciation course, and that's when the wine bug bit him. 
He also happened to be friends with the owners of Ridge Vineyards. And if you know your history, then you'll know that Ridge is another iconic winery. But they're out in Santa Cruz Mountains, near San Jose. They placed fifth in the 1976 Judgment of Paris Tasting. All right, anyway, through this friendship, Al started working harvest at Ridge. This helped give Al interest in wine. So after marrying Boots during this time, at least that's what I'm guessing, and gaining knowledge about the wine industry, Al and Boots found some property on Diamond Mountain, a total of 80 acres. However, remember only 20 acres were eventually planted the vineyards. This was pretty revolutionary at the time. Diamond Mountain wasn't vineyard land, but on the advice of Louis Martini, yes, that Louis Martini, and another legend of Napa winemaking, wine making, Andre Chelichev, he bought the land and planted Cabernet Sauvignon. At the time, there was less than a thousand acres of cab in all of California. All right, so you have to understand that back in the 60s, Cali was still churning out a lot of bulk wines. Things like those big jugs of Hardy Burgundy or Chablis and similar, uh, similar names or similar wines with names of European wine areas. Back before all the treaties were signed to not use these place names. What's worse about these wines is that they didn't even use the actual grapes from those European regions. Anyway, they planted their 20 acres of vineyards and had their first commercial vintage in 1972. The Diamond Creek name comes from the quartz in the stream that flows through the property. One interesting note is that the vineyards never got hit with phylloxera. So there are a very small amount of original planting still on the property. So phylloxera hit, even though phylloxera is an American thing, and it hit Europe and all the world, and American rootstock vines are, are immune, or resistant, that doesn't mean they're immune. So we did have a bit of phylloxera issues in California in the 80s, 90s, somewhere around there. Al passed away in 2006 due to Parkinson's, and Boots passed away in 2019, so really recently. The property was purchased by Louis Roderer out of France in 2020. The Rousard family, who owns Roderer, had known Al and Boots for many years, so I'm sure that connection is why the sale happened. I so take small production, iconic and historic status, consistently great wines for 50 years, expensive land and grapes all adds up to a wine that will sell for over $200. All right, that's going to do it for the show. Be sure to tune in next Monday for the blind tasting of all six of these wines. Will I nail them all? Correctly correlate quality with price? Or will my perception of quality and ma not match price? I have my thoughts on that, but I'll wait to actually taste these wines. I got links below to all the wineries and other sources I use for this in the description below. So please check them out. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe and then tell all your friends. And until next time, let's see what happens with these wines.